<clears throat> All right, so just trying to do a little stream tonight. Um, starting off with a nice friendly comment from someone. Thanks for all the hard work, man. Honestly, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Awesome. I'm glad I'm glad my stuff helps you out. I love your channel. Thank you so much. Uh, my only regret is not knowing you soon enough. Dang. Well, I'm glad my content has helped you all out. Um, t today, tonight, we... I'm also streaming on Twitch, by the way. I'm trying to grow Twitch. Also, I created a Twitter. I don't really like Twitter, but I'm trying to grow Twitter, too, just because it'd be dumb not to grow different social medias. Um, but yeah, I've been working on this like little T3 newsletter app. <clears throat> and I want to share with you all kind of what I worked on. Um, it, it is broken right now, so we're going to try to debug this together. And I just ate a giant um, hamburger, so I'll probably be clearing my throat a lot this stream. I always get so flimmy when I eat a hamburger. So I did some refactoring on this project to basically remove some MJS files, which I feel like they're kind of hacky to begin with. I don't know why they were there. So I'm just doing my own approach because I was trying to write just tests across this project and write some integration tests. But I kept running to issues. And <clears throat> I was just like, forget this. I'm not going to waste my time trying to figure out why this stuff won't load. So I just kind of deleted some files and refactored some stuff. Okay, so this is the error I was seeing. So there's like some files I still haven't fixed. Um, I'm going to try turning on the TypeScript experiment mode. Um, cool. Thank you for the uh, the follow, 25 gold, 25. Um, so I turned on an experimental flag, which basically will try to tra traverse all your TypeScript files and find any issues, and I'll kind of highlight it for you. So we got a file here called import, which I guess is importing a function that probably is doing something incorrectly. So I'm going to delete that. And let's just auto-import this like that. Now will my app load? That's the question. Still not loading. You cannot find a module. Okay, so let's figure out what's trying to load this file. And it looks like it's trying to be loaded here. Next config MJS. What is this? <clears throat> what is CJS? What are all these weird files? Can we just use TypeScript? Like, why is there MJS, CJS, like common JS files? Like, what's wrong with just using TypeScript for some of this stuff? Maybe you can't. But anyway, this thing's complaining because it's trying to import a file that I just I went ahead and just deleted. So, run builder dev with skip validation. I'm just going to delete that. I don't know what it is, but uh, goodbye. All right, is it working now? Looks like it's working, but it's running on a different port. LSOFI port 3000. What's eating that port up? I have a, a PID. I need to kill that one. Don't know what was taking up that port. Probably had like a, a rogue process going on. Let's just go ahead and load up my app real quick. And there you have it. <coughs> Uh, yeah, I could share you guys the link on Twitch. It's the same as my YouTube. Um, and I think the link is also in my profile. <clears throat> All right. What role are you? Are you a senior? I think I'd be considered a senior. I don't really have like a national role. Uh, the company I'm at doesn't really do like roles. Everyone's just a developer. Some developers have more experience than others. Um, and it's, you know, usually you can tell if someone's more experienced. Thank you so much for the uh, follow forever. I didn't catch what the name was, but 
Thanks for the follow. And Ritz Crackers. Thank you for the follow. <clears throat> um, someone asked, what are the main features of TypeScript that make it worth using? Uh, basically, it tells you when you type things incorrectly or try to access things that don't exist on objects. Or you call a function, you pass it the wrong properties. Those are the main things that are very beneficial, especially for um, even experienced people, because you make typos and you waste five minutes trying to figure out why something doesn't work because you misspelled something. That's the main benefit of TypeScript. You can actually have proper interfaces set up. Um, let's figure out where this is failing. I don't like warnings on my console. Whenever I get warnings, like just go ahead and fix them. All right. Okay, what am I doing today? I don't even know what I'm doing. So this is Dynamo. I have some mock services running locally. SES, nothing. This is, uh, let's say next. So what I plan to do today was I wanted to probably work more on testing some stuff. Kind of going through my application, figuring out where I could add more tests, where I could make stuff a little bit more uh, production ready. And also maybe re-inspect what I'm doing in terms of like clean architecture um, to make stuff, uh, I guess more professional, you could say. I might have to drop here in a second to go open the front door though. <clears throat> All right, I might zoom out. This I'm just too zoomed in, so hopefully you guys can see this text. All right, so uh, let me just walk you through what I have, what I what I worked on. So I added an integration test. If I go to this directory here, it says integration test, and what this does is I use Jest to write out a test that basically deletes this output folder, recreates it. And then it creates two subscriptions in my newsletter, right? So I have web dev, uh, Cody, and then we have Bob. And then I run a command from my terminal because what I plan to do is I, when I want to send out emails to all my newsletter subscribers, I'm just going to run a command. Like I decided to get a, get away from the approach of having like a, a dedicated UI for sending out stuff. Um, so I'm going to run this command and that'll basically take in the subject of the email. And then also I'm going to point it to an MGML file that's going to basically take the MGML template and this will convert it to HTML and then just send out the emails. Don't know if it's a good approach, but that's what I'm starting with. So the test does that. It creates two users, subscribes to them, runs this command, and the integration test is supposed to verify that when I run this, a directory should be created and that directory should have two subdirectories in it. And I'm verifying that, hey, like if this actually has tried to send out two emails in my system. And if I run this, I'll just go ahead and like uh, grab this file real quick. I'll say mpx jest run that file. <clears throat> you'll see it passes. And if I look over in SES, you'll see that it actually sent out well, it didn't actually send out anything because I have a locally running SES service, but the locally running service on port, like, I don't know what port it's on, basically intercepts the request that my SES SDK call was making, and it just outputs into a folder. So if I look at this output folder here, I have like the body that is sent out. Um, I have some headers so I can actually see, okay, it did send to Bob at example.com. Example it did send to webdevcody at gmail.com. Here's the subject. And what I plan to do is I want to check to make sure that like after this integration test runs and I have those two directories created, if I look at the headers.txt, I should verify that an email went out to webdevcody at gmail and an email went out to bob at example.com, right? So that's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to say 
verify the headers.txt file contains uh, bob at example.com and web at dev cody at gmail.com. Um, and real quick, some questions. Joe, Joan, Johan, will you be working on Socket.io chat app? Uh, no. Um, <clears throat> James Foreman, do you think services like X? Data in Superbase allow you to call data in your front end without the need for a separate API. I personally have never worked on a project that used Superbase or whatever, um, like Firebase or whatever. It kind of feels, some of these services can feel like vendor lock-in, um, which means that like once you start using their service, your data is stuck there and it's very hard to get your data off of that service. And then usually they end up charging you a lot of money user service so your company can be very very coupled to the service and that could make and break your business especially if you're like trying to do your own side project or startup um i i personally would rather just stick with the sql database and at work we use mongodb but i mean people say they like firebase so i'm assuming i don't know if superbase is like a, a replacement for firebase i don't really keep up with that stuff um been enjoying the content a bunch recently keep up the good work thanks john sanchez appreciate that and james foreman that was a question for cody yep i don't know if i answered your question I, I haven't used those technologies so i can't really talk about them um so how do we how do we check that there's two files here my zoom in just a little bit just because how do we check that these two files exist and that they have the right contents that we want so if i were to print out what emails is um emails is going to be 002848 whatever. So what I could do is just loop over them. Because I don't know what particular one is the one that I'm looking for. So I think I just need to loop over them. So I'll say const email of emails. Now I do think I should probably rename this. So I'm going to say like, um, I'll just say like email directory. And I'll say directory. And we want to basically, what do we want to do here? We want to, is this just a string? Is this a path? Like, even though you're using TypeScript, it's hard to tell what this is because read or sync, I think we'll just give you the, yeah, I think I'll just give you the actual file names here. So I think what we need to do is we would have to dive into each directory and read headers.txt. So I'm going to go ahead and say like headers equals read file. I'm just going to use read file sync for right now because this is in a unit test which runs sequentially anyway. If this was on an actual like express API, then you probably should never use read file sync or read dir sync. But again, this isn't a test. So like we know this is sequential and we don't care um, if this is like blocking the thread potentially. You know what? Maybe we probably should refactor that. I'm not sure how Jess works behind the scenes. So I'd probably have to go and actually check that up. But anyway, let's just go ahead and read the file sync. I don't know why I'm doing a callback here. I'm going to do output. And then I'm going to say dir. And then I'm going to do email directory. And that is going to read in headers.txt. Okay, so we should read in that headers file from that directory. And I'm going to go ahead and just push... I'm going to say all headers content. Make the, that an array for right now. And I'll just go ahead and say all headers content push headers text. So we loop over the files. We get the contents of them. I think sometimes you have to put UTF-8 or else it'll give you back like a binary array, which is not what we want. We want, we want a string back, right? So I'm going to read it, which I might have to actually type this as string or something. I don't know, but we'll push it in. And basically what I want to do is I want to verify that this array includes bob at example.com. Like if I were to look at to address, let's just do this. Um, I'm going to say all headers content, and I'm going to say some content, content dot includes, and I want to verify that it has a line that says 
webdevcody at gmail.com. Don't know why I just finished that up. Hold on. Webdevcody at gmail.com. I'm going to go ahead and do expect to be true. Or I could say to be true. How about that? Um, I'm going to do the same thing. And I might rethink what I'm doing. There might be a, a cleaner way to do this. But I also want to check over here, Bob at example.com. Like so. Um, and let's, I think we we implemented that logic, but there are some red squigglies on our code, so we got to fix the TypeScript errors. Um, first of all, directory is declared, but its value is never read, okay? Let's make sure that we use it. Now the second thing, unsafe assignment of any value. Now I've noticed that there's something going on with my ESLint server. Sometimes I have to restart stuff. There we go. Make sure I auto import that. And that's probably why I was complaining. Again, this is, this is answering an earlier question. Someone asked me like, why would you want to use TypeScript? This is why if I were to, like I was just calling a function that I didn't have imported. So it complained, it told me like, hey, you're calling something that doesn't exist. Sometimes figuring out what the issue is, is very uh, cryptic. Like over, I'm hovering over this and I'm getting an ESLint error, but really the real error is this. Cannot find name, read file, sync. Did you mean read file, sync? You know what I mean? So that's why I would say use a statically typed language. It just helps you out. It holds your hand a little bit more and it makes you more productive. It just takes a little bit of time to get used to like the errors and like what they mean. Um. <clears throat> So you should always ask yourself, is there a way to make this cleaner? Now I do see some repetitive logic here with the emails. I see some repetitive logic here with the subscribers emails that I'm using. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that const subscriber emails is equal to an array. Let's just go ahead and put this here. I'm gonna put this here. And then we are going to go ahead and do a for each on that. Um, actually, do I want to do a for each? I might just do a normal for loop, honestly. I'll say email of subscriber emails, and then I will await the email. You use a promise all if you want to, but I'm not trying to like, we're not writing super performant back in code. We're trying to write a test. So I'm going to add an email at a time. That's fine. Um, and then I'm going to use that subscriber email down here at the bottom. I can just go ahead and say for each here. And then for every email that's in that original list that we had, let's just run this same expect statement. And we're going to verify that, like, does this user exist in the uh, headers? Thank you for the follow gamer code 001. 001. Um, <clears throat> so this is complaining because like I have an ESLint set up to say like you have to like put real types on your things. So I'm going to go ahead and just say like, this is going to be an array of strings. Yeah, this is bearded theme, uh, for monotype. Oh wait, what theme is this? Oh, thank you for answering monotype. Yes, Chris, this is bearded theme and more specifically I'm using stained blue they got a lot of a lot of cool colors though i'm not sure if i like the blue it's kind of hard to read sometimes i kind of like the like more something like this kind of is easier for me to read in my bad eyesight maybe like that oceanic looks pretty nice too they got they got some cool stuff so i mean check it out that one looks cool um Anyway, let's just go back to this for a little bit. <clears throat> okay, so we haven't ran the code yet, so I don't know if this is going to work. But before I run it, let's just double check, read through the code, make sure I'm not doing anything that seems very obviously wrong. So email directory should have these two files in it, these two strings. I loop over both of those. And then I'm going to load in 
the headers of each of them. I put the headers content inside of this. I push it into a contents array, and then I loop over and do an expect for both of them. Um, now I could potentially make this a map function. This might be a little bit cleaner if you're ver if you're into like doing maps and like more functional type of programming. So this could be like a directory here, and then what we could do is we could say read file like this and I'm gonna get rid of the curly braces so it just go ahead it's just gonna go ahead and like return the contents right there and I believe I can delete all that so that cleaned it up a little bit I think that looks nicer um yeah let's just run this and see what happens Moment of truth, let's see if the refactoring helped. Well, this wasn't even a refactoring, this was like adding additional logic to my integration test. It passed. Um, so one thing I would recommend doing, whenever you write tests, make sure that your test is valid, right? So how do you verify a test is valid? Well, you go into the real code and you break some stuff. Like, so in this case, I could potentially go into um, a use case helper. Let's just go to the send emails. Let's look at the send emails. This is the, the file. What, what file is under test? I have a use case here. That's not the use case I'm testing. I'm testing a script. So let's open up the CLI script. That CLI script is basically a dummy wrapper that injects some it does some like dependency injection so that this send, send emails function doesn't have to know about how like process that env is read in doesn't have to know about file system i can mock that out and just mock that out um and then also send newsletter use case so if i were to go into the send letter use case which i think this is actually an interface at this point or a type Um, what I could potentially do. Actually, Donnie, since you're here, what's your suggestion on this? So I have a, a use case here, a function, and I'm basically just doing a type of on the function and exporting a type, and then I use that for my interface, which was here. Now, I guess my question is, is that proper, or would it be more proper to actually make like an interface here called... I send news letter use case and then kind of define the function there. I feel like this is so much extra overhead just to achieve the same thing, which is why I didn't do it. But I am curious about what your thoughts are on that. Someone says I should I should try power mode VS code extension. What is that? Is that like when you type and it like get combos and stuff in your screen shakes. I used to do that with Adam. I thought it was pretty fun. Okay, so what are we trying to do? Again, we're trying to break our code. Break our code to make sure that the test we just wrote actually does something. So the easiest way I could think about doing that is just add an extra character to the email or something. Uh, thanks for the follow, neat you. So let's just, we're just going to break this code and add an extra hyphen to the emails and when I run this it should fail because now the headers.txt and all those directories is going to have the wrong email so this didn't break now I think the reason this didn't break is because I'm doing it includes um, I probably actually need to do like a regex right so let's just take a step back and try to figure out what's going on so if I open up headers.txt notice that the hyphen at the end like the test is still passing, but I think we should probably be checking for a new line character at the end. Um, so let's go back to our test because our test is actually not good. We did not write a good test. This should actually, um, I think this should be a regex. And we could go ahead and make sure that it ends with a new line character. Maybe, I don't know if this is gonna work either. You probably can't use includes with a regex, can you? Um, <clears throat> so I might have to do a test. Wait, how do you do this? 
um, isn't it like, maybe it's the other way, not test. Content.test. I've already forgotten. Hello. I'm trying to see. I think it's called test, isn't it? Or it's the other way around. I think it's the regex.test, the content, right? So if I do this, dot .test content, this should return a Boolean, I think. Yep. So let's see if that fixes it. Also, I'm looping over the emails. Um, but can you do string interpolation in a regex like this? <clears throat> okay, I might have to actually say like, okay, <laughs> let's, let's do this. Let's, let's make this like this. I'm going to say const email regex equal new regex. I believe this, you can pass a string, right? How do you interpolate that? I don't know how to do this. So let's go ahead and go to JavaScript um, regex with variable interpolation. This is probably something I've done in the past. I've just forgotten how to do it. Pattern. Have to use a new regex constructor. Okay. Match this plus variable regex. Yeah, I think I was on the right track, hopefully. They're doing back ticks, they do interpolation here. Back ticks interpolation. Line character. I don't know. Let's just try it out. So I'm gonna go ahead and just say this dot test. And let's run this again. How's it going, Uza? My day is going good. All right, so the test is failing now. Um, and hopefully it's failing because remember we went to the code and we actually put this thing at the end. Let's, if we go and revert that, does that make it pass now? Moment of truth right here. Okay. Still failing. So I don't, okay, let's, let's rethink what we're doing because I don't think I'm doing something right. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to go to like JS bin real quick. I still use JS bin for a lot of stuff just for like playing around with some code. So I'm going to go ahead and put that regex here. And then for email, I'm going to say const email is equal to ccybert, or not ccybert, so I'll say web dev cody at gmail.com. And then I want to check, I'm going to say to address webdevcody at gmail.com. I think we had a bunch of different new line characters. So I'm going to say like my string is equal to this. Where's the headers? Let me go back to headers real quick. Where's the outbox? Outbox, get a headers. Just grab this whole thing. <clears throat> Oak extension, yeah, I need to. I was using that in the past before. It's probably better to, to do. I could just load up a. No, that's probably a much better approach. Why am I doing JSBin? Let's try that out. So I'm going to go get the Quoka extension, which I have used in the past. This one, right? Quoka JS. Go ahead and install that. I forget how to use it though. Does it just run over any JavaScript file or TypeScript file? Welcome, new file, new TypeScript file. All right, let's 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 try this. Instead of JSBin, let's actually upgrade to something better. And ESLint was configured to run on this. That's just an ESLint error, I think. I 
test.ts. Okay, so how does Coca, how do you run Coca? Run on save for current, run once for current file. Features only available in Pro. Yeah, Donnie, if you want to give me a, a quick breakdown, I've done this in the past, I just don't remember. I thought it like automatically started putting like runtime evaluations after stuff. Hmm. But I don't, I don't know what I'm doing, obviously, so. Can you check equality content equal to that? Well, the content has a bunch of different things in it, right? The content looks like this. So I need to make sure that it includes this with the new line character. Which maybe that's what I want to do. Maybe I should just do that. Why did I not do that? What am I doing? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do this. Content dot includes. Let me just try that. I don't know why I started going out regex. Like, if you can avoid regex, you might as well avoid it, right? What's this complaining about? <clears throat> you guys are going to watch someone debug a simple problem for probably an hour on a live stream. So congratulations for being able to witness this. Okay, it's passing. That's cool. But is it passing for the right reason? So again, I'm going to go back and just add a little new line character at the end. Or add a, a hyphen at the end. This should fail. Okay, I think that fixed it. I don't know why I went down the regex approach. Probably should never have done that. But this will also find the same thing, right? It's looking for a line that has two address, and then it has my email followed by a new line character, which is what we're kind of expecting in this um, outputs directory. Right. So let's go back. Um, I'll I'll look into Quoka another time. I know it's cool to use, but I don't want to go down that path right now. Cool. I'm gonna run it just in case. And again, the, the reason I'm adding this is like, it's always good to add at least integration tests. Some people don't like adding unit tests over your project, but at least integration tests that verify the, the full flow of like, technically this could even be like an end to end. There's no UI related to this, but I'm kind of like adding some data using the same use cases that my API would call. And then I run a script that would send out the emails and I verify that, hey, it actually tried to send out the right emails. Um, you can do slash slash question after lines or just log it yeah i might just even just use the debugger like quoke is cool but having the debugger and be able to step through and add watches the variables is probably a more powerful way to like achieve what i was trying to do honestly Oh, Donnie, why you're here, I did, um, before I read your comment, I did decide that, hey, I want to make this more efficient at sending out emails. Um, like I mentioned, there is a limit with how many emails you can send out with SES. And when you hit that limit, Amazon's going to throttle you and start throwing exceptions, which I haven't fully addressed that. Like, you probably have to wrap your code with retries or send off failed requests to a queue to have them reprocessed. But if I go to my use cases and I go to my thin newsletter use case, for the send email call right here, I actually pulled in a third party library called Throttle Queue, which is pretty cool. You can say, I want a queue that at most can process five emails a second. Uh, this true means space out the request so that you don't just like do five at a time and then wait a second and then do five more. It's gonna do one, wait 200 milliseconds, do another, wait 200 milliseconds. So I got this queue and hopefully if I understand how this works. Oh, thank you so much for the follow, feel good V3. 
if I understand how this works, I mean, I'm only going to be running this TypeScript file from a command line argument. So like this isn't behind an API. I don't have to worry about like having multiple APIs with their own throttle queue. So since this is the only piece of code that's ever going to be kind of sending out emails in my system, actually that's not true. Now that I think about it, this is actually used on my API when you subscribe. Um, but anyway, so what I'm trying to say is that there's this cool library where you basically just, you call throttle, you pass it a callback function, and it's going to go ahead and throttle those based on the time that you give it. So I think my account has like a limit of 15 emails a second. So I just said, okay, I'm just going to do five emails a second. So when I run the script, it will throttle down um, and hopefully work. Now I haven't tested this other than the integration test, which I guess is testing exactly what I need to do. Um, I would hate to run this script and send out a bunch of bad emails to 250 people because that would probably be a great way for them to all unsubscribe from my newsletter. Um, yeah, so let's go to chat real quick. I don't know if you guys have any questions about what I'm talking about or if half the stuff I'm saying is just over your head because you guys haven't messed with integration tests. I might, I might pull in Cypress. I might do some Cypress testing. It might be pretty fun to do on a live stream. Um, so I have been ignoring Twitch chat because I'm primary elite YouTuber. So let me go check out Twitch real quick. Superbase is the open source alternative of Firebase. Some use it to stop their massive prices and also reduce the vendor lock-in effect. Okay. Thanks for the follow, Maurice Hong86. Uh, let's see, neat to you. I'm subscribed to your YouTube channel. What a pleasant subscribe to see you on Surprised to see you on Twitch. Yeah, man, I'm just trying to diversify, you know. Um, get my get my brand out there a little bit on different streaming platforms. What is up, what? Let's see, random potato dev. Isn't promise all isn't promise all will send emails for every subscription that will have like millions of concurrent promises? You should have some concurrency and send newsletter use case file. Yeah, so that's kind of what I just talked about. I don't know if the concurrency really needs to be here or not the concurrency, the throttling or the, uh, the rate limiting. I, I don't know if it needs to live in the use case or if that's more of a concern of the actual send email function, right? Because potentially I could be sending this out to SQS queues. Some other process could be consuming from that queue and sending out those emails for me. Um, so I rather just have it loop through every subscription, do a promise all on this. And at some point, it should kind of, um, you know, kind of get through those, but I don't know. Ask Copilot to write it for you. Doesn't it log console logs? Um, this is probably comments from so long ago, so I don't know if I'm even, if it's even worth reading these. Neat you, I just started a hackathon last week inspiring me to try and convince my teammates to use TRPC. I already convinced them to use Next.js and TypeScript. They're never used these technologies though, so TRPC might be pushing it. Cool. Um, I mean, I'm not trying to like be, <laughs> I don't want to be a social media influencer, honestly. I just want to code and record myself coding. And if you guys like the, the way I'm doing stuff, then yeah, you guys can follow me. But I mean, I, I'm glad you guys like uh, TRPC. Regex is cursed. It sure is. Uh, let's see. Feels good. Your YouTube channel is amazing and has helped me a lot. Thank you so much. All right. Going to YouTube chat real quick. I don't know how far back I need to go for this. I'm so bad at answering chat. Okay. Um, speaking of Jess, can you provide the counter argument to Theo's take on unit testing since I know you're a fan? Um, I, I think unit testing can be overdone and done incorrectly, which I think is what Theo was kind of trying to say. Like you can waste a lot of time on unit testing if you write bad unit tests and you're mocking out the wrong things and you're like asserting the wrong things. But if you were to look through your code base um, and let's say you have a function that needs to sort things in a certain particular order, and maybe you have like nested sorting. So you have to do like three tier sorting based on like last name, uh, birth date and something else it's probably good to test that function, right? If you have a, a function that takes an array of objects, you want to assert that the thing that it returns is in the correct order, right? Your sort function does what it needs to do. 
Now, if you don't use a unit test for that, you're going to end up writing an integration test, which is going to run slower, or you're going to be writing an end-to-end -end test, which is going to be even more slow and probably a lot more flaky and breaking your CI CD pipeline. So a unit test runs super quick. It just runs the function, verifies the function, does what you intend it to do. And then you can simply just call that function from other files and have good confidence that like, hey, my sort function works. I know it works. So if I have a bug with the sorting, I know it's not the sort function. It's something else is causing the bug. And that helps you quickly debug issues um, if you have good unit tests, in my opinion. That's my counter argument. But I could see his argument of like, Sometimes you actually just spend more time just fixing tests, refactoring tests, and uh, writing tests. But uh, software engineering is not a race, right? We're not trying to like, unless you, I guess, unless you work at a startup, then yeah, you're probably, probably trying to beat your competition. But from where I've worked in the past and where I work now, it's better to slow down, do things the proper way, do things and test things and make sure that you're producing quality software. So that's why I like testing. Um, let's see. Thy Mantra Beats. Good day, Cody. Love your work. Keep it up. Thanks for the kind comments. I appreciate it. <clears throat> All right. Um, sorry, I'm not just going to have a loop on New Line. I'm watching from Argentina. Well, welcome for welcome from Argentina. Whenever I reach for regex, I always have to reconsider. Yeah, regex is pretty fun. Let me just skip through some of these. Can't remember the name. Okay. This React. Yes, this is React, but I am using Next.js. Um, you could technically test it by mocking the call to AWS. Um, don't next, Donnie, okay, let me not skip Natik Umtaz. What is the best way to test React applications? I don't see the difference between component testing and end-to-end -end testing. Um, I mean, component testing would be like using a React testing library and you're testing at a lower level. End-to-end -end testing is you're using like Cypress or Selenium or Playwrights, one of the new ones that I'm hearing uh, be talked about a lot. The difference is component testing is just testing a component, usually in isolation. Um, so it's going to run faster, and you can just mock out the things that that component needs to verify the component does what you need it to do. End-to-end -end testing is basically you're going to have to load up the entire application, load up the entire page. You might have 50 components on that page that all need to run and initialize, and you just want to verify that a button does something. Well, now that you have you have to wait so much extra longer because, like, the entire React application has to render the full page just so you can click a button to verify that it calls whatever API endpoint that you expect it to call. Um, so the difference is if the button needs to do some like some simple things and you just want to like verify it, like you probably want to do that at a lower level unit test or component test. Uh, as far as Donnie's question, does Next.js functions have a short lifetime? I, I think if you deploy it to Vercel, they have 10 seconds. But I would assume that that's either A, configurable, um, or B, if you don't deploy to Vercel and you just run in like a VM, it would run for as long as you want it to. But I have to go read the documentation to see. Uh, let's see, like for 10 minutes max for HTTP requests, or am I mixing up Lambdas? Lambdas have a 15 minute max. Uh, they used to have a five minute at some point. Amazon bumped up the 15 minutes. Vercel has a 10 second ma max on your API endpoints, which I could see very be very problematic um, for any endpoint that's actually doing like some real computation. Why is Next.js any better than React? Yeah, so Vasha. Next is built on top of React. So Next is like using React to help you build full applications that have static site rendering, have server-side rendering, incremental static uh, generation. Whatever. I don't know what the terms are, but you know what I'm saying, right? It's something that's built on top of React, and it just uses React, React's like template engine or you know the React library 
to render out your views and stuff. Thank you for the follow, Designate Arc. Um, we're sell serverless functions. Time limit is 10 minutes. Hold on a second. I'm pretty sure it's 10 seconds. I guess if you're on the free plan, it's 10 seconds. Hobby would be, yeah, serverless function execution timeout is 10 seconds. Now, if you go to the pro plan or enterprise, you get a lot of time. But I, honestly, if I had to go to enterprise, I would probably just host this all on Amazon myself because I'm not going to pay for a sell 2000 bucks to host my, my site, to be honest. Um, but for a hobby project, I guess you just have to keep that in mind. Anytime you're deploying or making an API, make sure that you're not hitting that 10 second timeout or you're going to have um, some issues. That's a good lesson too. Whatever tech that you use, you got to read through the docs and understand like what limits are they going to place on what you're doing? Because this has bitten me in the butt so many times with Amazon. Like you just use Amazon. You're like, oh, this will be fine. I'll make a little function that just sends out some emails. You deploy the prod. You end up sending like 50 emails in a burst. You get 30 throttle exceptions. And now you don't have emails sent to 30 people. You didn't add any type of try catches to verify that like, hey, when the email fails, what do we do? You have to, you know, reprocess it and store it somewhere. And you should really start with like the limits of the service you're using and make sure that it's not going to affect the, the logic that you're building, which kind of stinks because like the, where you're deploying your code, like what service is really dictating how you design your code. And it kind of should be the other way around. Like I should be able to design my code and have it run the way I expect it to, regardless of where it's being hosted. But it turns out that these limits really, really dictate how you, architect your system. Okay, what makes you choose Next.js over making a backend server with Express? <laughs> um, I think the main argument I would give is speed. Um, because if you make your own backend with Express, like, obviously you're decoupling your backend from your frontend, which is good, but Next.js just gives you a the ability to develop faster, in my opinion, because everything is just like a simple, everything is kind of contained in your next server. Um, so your UI and your API is all just in a single place. It's super easy to manage and run and deploy. If your backend is in Express, you have to have a separate process for managing, deploying that. Maybe you have a separate repo for um, storing that code, separate CI CD pipeline, separate tests. So for a smaller team or a startup or just like a side project, using a technology that has everything bundled together can really help you hit the ground running, in my opinion. But on a larger project, like an a enterprise scale project, I mean, I, it might be better to decouple your API because what if just you decide that your API needs to be written in Go because you really need to squeeze performance out of your, your requests and your response times? Well, now Next has been like, your API code is basically coupled to all your React code. It's all in TypeScript. It'd be a big effort to kind of switch that over to Go. Potentially. I mean, you could... Ref you could... I don't know if that's a good argument. Let me just stop talking. Well, on a repo looks nice. You don't need to set up all the boilerplate code to run Node if our cell handles that all for you. What is mono repo? Is that another tool? Is that like NPM workspaces? Have you used Cypress Component Testing? I, ha I have not used that yet. How's it going, Oscar? Next also has an option to have custom Express Server. Okay, I'll have to go check that out. Uh, Oscar says, what do you recommend I do to stay motivated? I also can't seem to think of a project idea that I'm interested in or won't get bored of. I'm also trying to Trying to start learning back in. Um, I don't know. You kind of just have to build something that you think will be interesting for you to build. Um, it's hard to stay motivated when you're not getting money for what you're doing, right? So if it's just a side project, you know, I raise my hat for the people who can work on the same side project for like months at a time and actually build something crazy. Like the people working on Svelte or the people working on Vue or SolidJS. Like the fact that they can stay so focused on their project and never like 
I'm, I'm sure they get unmotivated at times, but it, it becomes more of a discipline thing of like, this is kind of like what I have to do. I have to wake up and I have to work on this. Is Redux worth using? I don't like it personally. I don't, I wouldn't use Redux personally, uh, but some people like it. I think it has its benefits for like decoupling and decoupling your UIs from your state and stuff. Let's see, Donnie says, we have a sync service at work using Firestore batch under the hood. I learned that it breaks if the batch has more than 500 docs last week. Yeah, exactly. So going, going with my point of like all these things that you're using, they have limits and these limits can really screw up the way that you solve the problem. Um, if you know these limits up front, you can architect, architect a better system. Um, but sometimes it's just too hard to know, like what are the limits to everything? Uh, greetings from London, developer currently on holiday in Buenos Aires. Well, welcome to the stream. Don't you be like chilling by the beach or something instead of being on my stream? But welcome. Where's the coding part? Yeah, okay, let me get back to coding because you guys are probably getting bored, huh? Let me check Twitch real quick. Okay, no one's on Twitch. Cool. Um... Yeah, so let's let's just try bringing in Cypress real quick. I don't know how hard this will be. Some things you gotta kind of gauge before you do it on a live stream because you know that like this is gonna be a time sink, and I know I'm not gonna make progress doing this, but let's just do it for anyway because I think having Cypress would be a cool thing to kind of have on my project. So let's just npm install save dev Cypress, and let's go to the documentation. Um, let's see, npx cypress. Let's go to getting started. Let's do installation. Let's make sure we do this right. So we already saved it. Okay, blah, blah, blah. I'm pretty sure there's like a cypress init thing you have to run. Great, now install Cypress. Isn't that what we just did? We just installed Cypress. <laughs> what type of docs are these? How do you say install Cypress? And then at the bottom of your docs, you say, great, now install Cypress. You click it, it goes up to the top of the, uh, the docs. It's like, this should be a separate page. Anyway, I'm just complaining about stuff. Uh, let's see, so it's npm, npx Cypress open. Add the script in. I use Cypress at work, but it's been so long since I actually set it up that like I don't remember half the things you have to do. npm run Cypress open. So what this is going to do is I believe it will initialize a project for you. It's a cool little walkthrough wizard that they have. That I believe this is using like Electron or Chromium to basically walk you through setting up Cypress for the first time. Um, I'm just going to do end-to-end -end testing though. I haven't done the component testing. I'm not really... Uh, willing to do that right now on a stream, but let's read this. We've added the following conf files to your project. Okay, thank you. And you could pick where you want to test your code. Um, I'm going to say start testing in Chrome. Create your first spec. So a spec is basically a file. Uh, I guess it's short for specification, I think. But it's just a way to like basically write your test, okay? Um, I'll generate several examples of specs to guide you how to write tests. I'm just going to go ahead and create a new spec, then we're going to YOLO this. Maybe ChatGPT can give us an example. Um, so the spec we want to write, I'm going to go ahead and say like a user, user subscribes. Go ahead and make that file. Let's just go ahead, go ahead and... Uh, so if I go over my code, it added that to my project. Okay, so if I have a Cypress folder now, it's got some folders in it. Cool. It's got my spec file here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have it load up my application, right? So my app is running on localhost 3000, I believe. And I'm going to go ahead and say um, loads up the newsletter app. And in the describe block, this is usually like you kind of describe what this end-to-end -end test is going to do. So I'm going to say a user can subscribe to my 
newsletter. All right, let's just run this. You know what? I think I'm probably missing types. What's this complaining about? Describe a suite with a given title. Complaining. Do I need to import this or something? Um, I might have to like import something. Why is this, why is this happening? Cannot be compiled under isolated modules because it is considered a global script file. Add an import and export or an empty export statement to make it a module. Really? I really have to do this? I haven't had to do this before, so I might have to go and like read up why I have to do that. It's probably because I haven't imported anything yet. So if I had like a helper function, I imported that, like it would work. Um, but yeah, let's go back to Cypress. I'm going to click this, and what this is going to do is... Uh, I need to make sure I open up the right Chrome browser. Okay, so this is my app, right? It's hosted on localhost 3000. Awesome. Now, when I run this spec file, it should load up Chromium, point it to localhost 3000, and that's my test, right? And I can start doing different things, like I could have it type into this email. Um, now, people watching, is there a way to have Cypress like record actions and just make the test for you? I know Playwright can do that, which is pretty cool. But what I'm going to do is just read through the docs because we want to be able, be able to basically say, um, a user types their email into the form like this and we'll say sci.git and I believe we want to get the um, let me go to the index and see what what's the ID of that input do I even have an ID on that I have an email ID okay so I'm going to get the email based on ID here some people like using the data ID or test test ID or something. Um, some people like using ARIA labels. Some people like testing against like different attributes. I think IDs are fine. I would never test about, I, I wouldn't really test with class names because those are like style based and those could change, but I think IDs are fine. Um, some people would probably say it should be a test ID. And in fact, if you go to Cypress, I believe they tell you it should be a test ID. Data test, data size. Um, where is that? I remember reading in their docs. Cypress data size attributes for testing. Here's another pro tip. If you're ever using a language or a library or framework, try to find to see if they have the best practices and read through it. Now, if I was like a legit good developer, I would have read through all this already, but I like cutting to the chase and let's just go ahead and find like data si and let's see what it talks about. Best practice. So selecting elements is highly brittle selectors that, oh, using, let me, let me stop. An anti-pattern is using highly brittle selectors that are subject to change. Okay. So is an ID subject to change? Potentially, yeah. So a better pra practice is to use a data attribute. So they recommend that you get your stuff like this. Okay, and they even, oh, they give you a nice little table, right? They say, never do stuff like this, never do stuff like this. Sometimes you could do stuff like this. So I'm right now I'm in the category of using it sparingly. Um, so let's do it the always way. Let's just go ahead and change this to like, um, data die and that'll be called email input like that and we're going to go ahead and get data psi well input did i do that right let's go back and make sure it looks good so that should look at the page find that element and i'm gonna go ahead and say type and i want to type in web dev cody at gmail.com so let me show you something cool with cypress every time i save this test it's actually going to go back and rerun my test file, which is pretty cool. Although it is failing, it's saying that I could never find data psi email input. 
Why can I not find that? Yeah, that's a good point. Someone says, I prefer test ID over data sci, so it isn't so tightly coupled to Cypress. I could, I could be down with that change too. I could do test ID. So that way, I think that's also what the React testing library recommends you use, like a test ID. Actually, no, React testing library recommends you don't use test IDs. They recommend that you actually like use ARIA labels and stuff to click on your UI. Um, but that's another topic. Let's just rerun this. I think I probably have something wrong. Um, it should be loading up my newsletter. Is it because we're like not waiting for the page to finish loading or something? You need browser context is reset between tests, so you need a side visit in the next test or in the before each. that true? I'm pretty sure this is how we do it on our work project and we don't have to do a side eye visit every single time. But maybe I'm wrong. That's stupid though. I don't want to reset the context. Why, why would we reset the context? I guess we could do everything here. But then like... Cypress don't reset browser context between its statements. There must be some configuration we use at work. Yeah, hold on. I don't think it's a... Uh... Oh, hey, Tina. You finally joined, huh? Welcome to the stream. Everyone say hi to my wife. It's Tina Cyper in the YouTube chat. Go ahead and give her a wave emoji for me. Let me let me try doing this side out wait. I'm just gonna wait for like two hundred uh two thousand milliseconds to see what happens. Wow. Uh, I might have to go back to the docs and actually make sure I understand like what I'm teaching because I'm teaching something wrong. Uh, there's something fundamentally I do not remember about Cyprus, but I didn't think you'd have to like do a visit between your it statements. Yeah, maybe I should go back to the best practices and read it. <clears throat> Having tests rely on the state of previous tests. Anti-pattern is coupling multiple tests together. An example of what not to do. So I'm doing exactly what they say not to do. I'll go ahead and uh, pat myself on the back for that one. They expect you to combine it all into one test. Run shared code before each test. Fine. So load the UI and type into the form. I guess we just do it the wrong way at work. That's cool. Oh, I, I know the like you should never have a wait on an end to end test. I was just doing it to kind of debug an issue. Um, but yeah, you should never use a side out wait. All right. So if you look here, anyway, let's just let's just continue forward. Um. You see here, it actually entered in my, it typed into this. Let me just show you real quick. I'm gonna click replay. For those of you who haven't actually seen Cypress before, you'll see it actually go through your application and do stuff. Like, I don't know if you saw that, but it types really quick in the bottom. And when your test is like more steps, like let's say you have a 50 step test, 
you can kind of go and hover your cursor over the previous steps and see like what changed over time. It's really useful. You can actually click on stuff and like inspect the DOM at that particular element if you want, or at that, that, that particular time. Anyway, let's just click the button. All right, so we got a subscribe button here. Let's go back to the index. Let's add a data test ID to the button itself, which I'm going to go ahead and say subscribe button. And in our test, we want to get that button like so. Data test ID equals that. And we want to click it. Let's just click it. And after you click it, you should expect something, right? We should expect us to be navigated to a page that says success. So let's look at our success page. And actually we could say, um, I don't know how to do this. I have to go remember. Isn't it like sci dot URL um, good equal I'm going off my faulty memory at this point, but I think it should be equal to like localhost 3000 slash success. Now there might be a way to just check the base URL and like not have to put this localhost stuff in. Let's see what happens if you do that. So I can't find the subscribe button. Um, data test ID subscribe button. Let's make sure that's props that are actually being interpolated they're not so let's just do that I'm plenty about okay type children disable blah 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 String here undefined is not assignable to type button submit reset undefined. The string is not assignable to type button. This is one thing I don't like about TypeScript. It's like so archaic to read through the error messages. And I'm just bad at it. Types of property type are incompatible. What does that even mean? Because it feels weird. I shouldn't have to like say, you know, data test ID is equal to props.test ID. That just seems, that seems wrong. I'd rather just pass in the props here. Maybe someone in the chat knows. Like, I bet you this is one of the situations where this will work perfectly fine. Like, if I go and run my test, like, this might actually pass. Yeah, it clicks the button and it works, it works perfectly fine, but because I'm using TypeScript, I'm doing something that's making TypeScript angry, and I'd probably spend 30 minutes trying to debug the issue versus if I was using JavaScript, I'd be done. You know, I'd, I'd commit this and I'd be done and happy, but I will say you do spend a lot of time making TypeScript happy, depending on the way you have TypeScript set up. But I guess I also want to check, like we're, we're on the right page, right? We verified that we're on the success page in that test, and that was green. And there could be some other things that you want to check too, like, you know, maybe clicking on one of these links will take you to the right <clears throat> page. We could try doing that too. Um, let me scroll up a little bit in the chat. I'm not missing anything. Hey, Twitch, Twitch chat. Just use data sci on the element. So what am I trying to do right now? I'm trying to debug why TypeScript is angry. This. Property of type. The types of property type are incompatible. The string is not assignable. Type of button, submit, reset, undefined. I guess I can go Google this. 
Let's see what it's saying. Okay, I guess this is probably saying that like props could potentially be undefined. Is that what it's complaining about? No? Let's try this real quick. Nope, that's not it either. Okay, someone, Toby Curry, what is the benefit of this rather than just doing it yourself? It seems like it would be a lot faster to test it manually. I have never done something like this, so I'm genuinely curious. I recently graduated boot camp, so I'm new to testing. Um, imagine you have an application that has over 100 pages, and every page has tons of different components and functionality. Uh, it, it's up to you and your team to make sure that when you change code, you're not breaking one of those 100 pages, right? So imagine how long it would take you to go through and test all these pages manually when you have 100 pages, right? So that's, that's why, in my opinion, you'd write automated tests because although it does take you a couple of hours to write these tests, in the long run, I know I don't need to go back and verify if I can subscribe or not because I have tests that will run and verify that people can subscribe, right? This is a, a mission critical path to your application. If people can't subscribe to your newsletter, your entire application is basically worthless, right? Same with like a login flow. If users can't log into your application and some change you make in the code breaks that, then your whole, like it, that's bad. It's bad for your application, it's bad for your business. So you don't want to have to test, can I log in every single time you do a deployment, especially if you're working with like an agile mindset of you want to deploy multiple times a day. You want to just have tests run, verify everything's good, and then get that deployed. Also, when you're working on a team of 10 other developers, there's a high chance that someone who's new to the project is going to change some code that breaks functionality across your entire application, and they won't know that they broke that. And you don't know the test that because you don't know exactly what they're changing in their code because you have your own tasks that you're trying to work on and they might get their code merged in the dev, get it deployed to prod and they break everything because you didn't have a chance to go and review their code or something. So that's kind of the argument as to why you'd want to write these tests. Um, there is a TypeScript extension called TS Air Translator. I think I tried that, but it didn't really Give me good later. Nicholas Costa, as a first week junior, I agree. And I'll also say that if you join a project that has tons of files and you have no tests, it's very scary for a beginner or a junior to even want to touch code because they don't know what they're going to break. But if you join a project that has 2000 integration tests, and the moment you change something and you break a page, it turns red in your CIC pipeline. It gives that junior more confidence of like, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, you know, merge this PR because it's breaking stuff. And plus, if an application has been around for like years, no one knows all the business rules, right? The business rules end up getting documented and basically um, verified via these tests because people leave companies all the time, and You'll join a project and have no idea about all these different edge cases that the business cares about. Um, and the tests really help verify that you're not breaking those like edge cases. <clears throat> yeah, and Jacob, so like, let me address that. Cause you don't, typically if you're on a team, you're going to have something called a, a CI CD pipeline set up. You might have heard of like GitHub Actions or something. So every time you make code changes and you make a pull request, it's going to run all these tests for you in a server somewhere, right? So you're not manually like running these tests. Some server is going to run your 500 tests within five minutes and it's going to tell you what pages you broke because you made a change. That's kind of, it, it's just super useful. I couldn't imagine ever being on a project that didn't have a lot of tests. I think I would probably quit that project, honestly. Uh, let's see, do you save with Mongo? I don't really use Mongo. Um, 
How do I do this? Why, why is this hard? Can't spread props. Props extends HTML props, HTML button elements. So React type script error when spreading props extends HTML props. I bet you if I got rid of this, would this work? I could try using chat GPT. It's like been down. I try, I try looking at it. Yeah, it's broken. Chat GPT is just like down. So. Yeah, I think testing is one of those things where a lot of like self-taught devs and junior devs don't know about. And so if you come into an interview and you say like, I know what a UDA test is, I know what an integration test is, I know what a smoke test is, I know what end-to-end -end test is, I know what um, accessibility pally testing, axe testing is. If you know how to talk about those things, like it's just going to put you way beyond any other person that is interviewing who doesn't know those things. Um, and if it's a serious company that you're interviewing at and they care about tests, which you should probably ask in your interview, but like what code, what, what code um, coverage do you guys do for your unit tests? Like you should ask your employer, your potential empl employer, like how much do they test? And if they can't give you some good solid answers to that, that's a red flag in my opinion. Um, so what do y'all think about this? Should I just like, oh yeah, I was trying to go Google some stuff. I should probably say React. Okay, React TypeScript useful pattern use case. Props, button props. Button props extends component props without ref. What is that? Components props without ref. I wonder if I did it this way. Would that complain? No. Still broken, huh? Props is rest is loading. Rest as try this. Oh, let's just go back. I don't know. Makes me miss JavaScript. I don't have VPN set up, so that's not my issue. Go private mode? Okay. Chat GPT incognito window. Too many redirects. Okay, let's just go to the main homepage. Um, openai.com. How do I, okay, let's go here. Yeah, it's just broken, y'all. I mean, does it work for you all? It's so hard. You know, the, I understand why people don't like TypeScript especially beginners, because with me, I've been coding for almost 10 years. I know I'm going to waste about a couple of hours trying to figure out this issue, right? I, I'm going to have to reach out to people who are like expert at TypeScript to try to figure out what's going on here. When I, this is solved, like my, my feature works exactly, exactly the way I need it to. My test pass, everything's good. But because this is red, I'm going to spend hours trying to figure out what's going on here. I'm going to go to like 50 different GitHub or Google result pages to try to figure out the answer to this. And it's going to be the, the simplest thing. It's going to be me just having to change something here, like adding a question mark or an undefined or something. But since I'm not that great at TypeScript, I don't know. And then the errors of TypeScript are just so awful 
that it doesn't even help me. Detailed HTML props. What an HTML props? Like, do I need to say this? Is that a thing? React dot detailed. No. Try the component props without Ralph. Yeah, I can try that. Maybe I should just try that anyway, shouldn't I? This. I love you, Cutsy. 27. That's all I have to say. That's another problem. I don't try I don't try these examples. But now it's like I okay. <laughs> Let me talk to you real quick. Let me talk about what what annoys me with just taking code and copying and pasting it, and I don't know what it's doing. Like I don't know what why this fixed my issue, right? And so I could just continue going forward. I think you aren't allowed to pass ref as props. But okay, so I wasn't passing a ref. Okay, so you're saying that there's some HTML elements like button that cannot take in a ref? Or you can't pass, okay, you can't pass the ref as props. You'd actually have to do like a forward ref or something. Okay, let me actually read this. What site am I on? Maybe I should read through this whole site and actually understand what the heck I'm doing. That's probably my first issue. Useful patterns by use case. Wrapping or mirroring. Wrapping or mirroring HTML elements. Use case. You want to make a button that takes all the normal props of a button but does extra stuff. Well, that's exactly what we're doing. So if I would read some text, I'd probably be able to debug faster. Strategy. Extend React component props without ref. HTML elements can take a ref, but a React component can't. But if you're spreading props, it doesn't know if one of those props is potentially a ref. And I hope one day I'm as good as you as a developer. I just feel like I'm so bad at TypeScript. Well, I mean, we got it working. Let's commit. <laughs> Let's commit what we have. Um, going on over here. Made some changes. I think the code's in a better state. I added Cypress. That's cool. I added a spec. That's cool. So I'll just say adding Cypress and an int end test to verify subscriptions. There we go. Cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, so y'all have any, any questions for me? Okay, let me bookmark this. I know I need to read through this. Just go ahead and bookmark this and I will try to read through it on my own time. Because I bet you this has a lot of good information in it. I just don't have the energy to read through that right now. I have a question for you, Cutsy27, since you seem like you're pretty knowledgeable. Are you the type of dev who would like read through this whole thing and try to get a good understanding of like the intricacies of TypeScript and React? Like, like, I need to level up my game somehow. And for some reason, I find it so hard just reading through docs and trying to like, I don't know, it's just so dry. But I feel like I'd be much better if I just sat down for like two hours and read through every single page so that if I were to come across some little piece of useful information, um, I wouldn't be stuck for a long time trying to debug. Well, let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to let's see Twitch. Nothing, no one on Twitch. I don't know if people are even watching my Twitch. I got one viewer on Twitch. That's cool. Um, Let's see. Yo Yo says, how do you find these ideas for personal projects? 
Um, I don't know. I just kind of like think about things that I would like want to build for helping my YouTube channel grow. And I'm like, well, how do how do people make these these newsletter subscribers, right? Because a lot of people just use existing stuff. There's tons of things out there like MailChimp. I don't know what else is out there, but there's stuff out there that like people can easily subscribe to your newsletter and then you can use MailChimp. You pay them like 20 bucks a month to send out emails. Um, I'm the type of person who doesn't want to spend 20 bucks a month for sending out emails. I'd rather just bribe my own application to save some money. Because it's like, I don't even know if I'm even going to pursue this newsletter thing. This is just something I'm just playing around with. But do I really want to spend every week writing like newsletters for you all? Probably not, to be honest with you all. But it'd be good to have a, a subscriber list of emails in case I do decide to like want to do something interesting. What's a good starter React project I should try to learn back in? Um, not really sure. Hey Cody, any resources or recommendations for learning integration tests? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, honestly, I don't really have good recommendations. Like, I don't have bookmarks. I don't have anything bookmarked. I don't have anything like saved for good resources. Um. Hold on a second. Um, yeah, I'm gonna wrap up the stream. Um, my kid said that she hurt herself on something, so I've been going for like an hour and a half, so I hope this, uh, stream was kind of useful. Um, sorry that I didn't get past all this other stuff. Let's see. Name of other things I hear with every single operating system. Right? Hit library or two in TypeScript and you'll be golden. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> that would definitely help me learn some stuff by writing a library. I'd really get good at generics and stuff. But this is an issue with React, right? Like this is React and TypeScript. I mean, not understanding the React types and the React interfaces and how you can extend them. I read docs a lot, but usually start when I run into an issue, like you already mentioned, the Cypress docs and their best practices are really helpful. Um, Juan Carlos says, you are more of video or reading docs? You are more a video or reading docs. I'm not sure what that means. Oh, um, I, I, I kind of, it depends. If I just want to crash course on a new thing, I will watch a video real quick and then I'll go through the docs. If there's a bug I'm trying to get through, I will just go to Google and try to go through the docs and just try to figure out like if they will help me. I guess that's a good motivation for projects. You have money on the tools out there. Would you test the request of the subscription of a newsletter in Cyprus? Would you test the request for the subscription of the newsletter in Cyprus? I don't know if I understand that question. Would you test the request? Why is Angular so unpopular? I don't really know. I mean, when I used it, I thought it was pretty good. Thanks for the follow, Rishan Kumar. What is my stream schedule? It's, I don't really have a schedule, but if I do stream, it's usually on the weekend. Usually it's Sunday mornings, but I decided to stream tonight. Um, so you could also check to see if I'm streaming Sunday morning around like 9 a.m. Central, or 9 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Eastern. But it's no guarantee I have kids, and my kids will sometimes, um, like, eat up my time, time in the morning. And it also depends on how I feel. Sometimes I just don't feel like streaming. Uh, you got to be in the correct mindset, I think, to actually stream. Angular is old. I mean, when I use Angular, I thought it was pretty good. 
it just it has more overhead right like to learn angular you have to kind of know typescript right and that's that's one that's going to prune out a bunch of people who are trying to learn how to code because now you have to learn typescript to learn angular and then you got to learn like what is dependency injection because i believe angular has a lot of that uh, baked into their framework and then you're kind of tied into using like whatever their testing library is. Is it called Protractor or something? I don't even know. I haven't used Angular in so long. Um, do you have any experience with frame or motion? I, I don't think I've used that before. I don't really do animations. Cool. Well, I hope this was uh, beneficial for you all who have been watching. Um, I'm going to wrap this up and uh, check out tomorrow morning to see if I am streaming. No guarantee. But uh, have a good day. And happy coding. Actually, let me take out, check out Twitch real quick. Anybody message me on Twitch? Nope. Cool. All right. Later, all.